Hello and welcome to Ogmore by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church. I hope you're doing well and it's great that you can join me as we start out reading through Joshua. We are reading through Joshua, Judges and Ruth during December 2023. So we've got an awful lot to get through. So we better pray and dive in. Heavenly Father, here we are. We come before you in the name of Jesus, the Saviour, who has died for our sin and risen again to put us right with you. And in, in his name we come and we ask for mercy and we pray you would graciously speak to each one of us. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Joshua comes after the Torah. It's the first book of the, the history kind of section of the Bible. And the story of God's people up to this point is, well, you have, let's go back, right back. You've got Genesis, the book of beginnings, and you have the beginning of the heavens and the earth. And then you have the beginning of evil and Adam and Eve cast out of the garden. And then you have the beginning of the story of redemption. <clears throat> and you see how Abraham is chosen by Jesus, the word of the Lord. And it's Abraham's family that are given promises. And all the promises center around the seed of Abraham, the one offspring of Abraham through whom the whole world will be blessed. But you also see little pictures of the blessing through that one seed uh, played out in various ways. Uh, but Abraham's family grows into a nation in Egypt and in Egypt there they are oppressed and through at the hand of Moses the Lord brings them out of that slavery, leads them through the wilderness and eventually brings them into the promised land. But Moses doesn't enter but it's the one who is his, it's his protege, it's the one who comes after. And Joshua is the Hebrew, your Yeshua is the Hebrew for Jesus. Jesus is the Greek, it's the same name and it's profound that it's not Moses, the lawgiver, who brings God's people into the promised land, but it's Jesus who comes after, who Moses uh, precedes and also points towards, testifies to. It's, it's this Joshua who brings God's people home. Um, yeah, and we get a bit of the, the rundown of that in the opening section. But without further ado, we better dive in. <clears throat> so chapter 1, verse 1 of Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. A couple of things. The success of Joshua and also all the Israelites do not depend on their military might or their own ingenuity. It is on their faithfulness to the Lord their God. That's the key to 
to their success. Um, and Joshua here is being instated as this prophetic, uh, prophetic, uh, what's the word? Not predecessor, but whatever. Prophetic protege of the prophet. <laughs> uh, what I mean by that, that's really convoluted, sorry. But um, Moses spoke of the, the, a prophet like him to arise from within the Israelites uh, who will speak and everyone must listen to what he says. And it's ultimately speaking of Jesus, the Lord, our Christ, the Christ. But, the, but Joshua is like a little picture of Jesus. In that way, he's fulfilling that kind of prophetic role, but also in the kingly role as well. This idea of meditating on the law of the Lord day and night. I think it's Deuteronomy 17, which talks about uh, the king uh, who's to rule over God's people. Under God. But what a brilliant promise. This is our memory verse as well here. Verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that's our promise today as well, that we have the living God dwelling in us and with us by the Holy Spirit. He is stronger than the spirit that's in the world, infinitely stronger, far, far superior. So we don't need to be afraid. Our spirit, our God's spirit, the Holy Spirit brings the presence of the Father and the Son to make their home with us. So what are we afraid of? It's not this self-confidence. It's this confidence in the God who loves us, who is greater than any problem we may face, and who is with us. He's not distant or aloof. Verse 10. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, Get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan where, uh, sorry, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But the Reubenites, the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, or to them, he said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, but all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you. And until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So we've already read in previous reading sessions, probably months ago now, of how the there were kingdoms, you know, like a, the Ammonite kings, is it Og? And oh, it's gone out of my mind. But there were, there were, la there were lands allotted to these tribes, and so they already took possession of this place, but it was stipulated that they, their fighting men, must help in the conquest of the rest of the land. They can't say, well, we've already got yours, we're sorted, you go sort yourself out. No, they need to help. Verse 16, then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. <laughs> if you know the story of how the people were uh, in obey, in obe walked in obedience to Moses, you realise that, oh, <laughs> this. anyway. Um, only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, we will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So there we are. Um, Joshua foreshadowing 
the fullness of the promises about the prophet who's to come into the world and the king of kings. So it's all teed up there. Joshua is now at the leader of God's people and they're about to cross over the Jordan. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Remember how Moses had sent 12 spies into the land 40 years prior to this? There's a lot of echoes of what has come before in how Joshua is retracing kind of the, the steps of Moses but in a better way. Verse 2, the king of Jericho was told, look some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Uh, there's, this isn't like the main part of the story, but there's an interesting side point um, in terms of telling white lies, you know, and there's stories of people who hid uh, Jewish folk in Germany and other areas where the Nazis were out to get the Jews and they told lies to cover up, to protect these people whose lives were at stake. And I think passages like this, as well as the uh, the Hebrew midwives way back at the beginning of the book of Exodus, I think it shows that we can't tie ourselves up in legalistic knots, um, saying we always must absolutely um, tell the truth the law is love the law is love and it's helpful sometimes when you're down in the messy details of life on planet earth to remember these big overarching principles in terms of this compassionate love and the sacredness of life and, and all these things um, and of course like Having allegiance to the living God, who is love, is important as well. And fearing him above all others. So it's just an interesting point which um, speaks into that kind of discussion. Verse 8. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og. There we go. Those are the two Am 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 Amorite kings. Oh, they weren't Ammonite. They were Amorites. East of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth and on the earth below. This is an interesting point when it comes to uh, discussion around the morality of the conquest of Canaan and people throw words around like genocide and all this. It was it was a particular place. Um, there is hyperbolic language in terms of the total destruction but then when you read the details uh, that there, there are people left. Um, it's not a complete annihilation, as you might assume by reading some of the, the phrases. Um, but also, there, 
it, this didn't come without warning. This goes right back to the time of Abraham and the Lord's promises made to him about this land. And so they had like 400 years, more than 400 years, to realise that their way of life is dead set against the living God who will one day call them to account for their detestable practices. And now they will realise that the time has come. But also the Lord, as we read in Ezekiel, the Lord doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked and he'd much rather than turn. And Rahab, as we'll see, is the prime example of there is a path to life, but it's a narrow way. They all know that the time is up and they know that the Lord their God is with them and is the Lord. Verse 12, now then, Rahab continues, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. And that's quite reminiscent of the Passover, isn't it? Staying inside and the judgment passing over. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. So it's a different kind of report to what the 12, well, what the 10 spies came back with 40 years before. It's interesting that and Joshua was one of those spies, wasn't he? <laughs> so maybe that's why he only sent two out in the first place is because only two came back with a good report and Joshua was, was one of them. Um, so Rahab, she believed the Lord. She believed that the Lord was going to carry out what he said he would do and therefore she believed that there was no hope in Jericho and trusting in the military might of the king of Jericho or any other armies within Canaan. She realised that God was going to do what God has said and that God was going to judge. But she also relied on the mercy of the living God. And that's, yeah, so she is a believer. And through that faith, there is hope. There is life through judgment, salvation. Um, and another important point is to show that being part of God's people has never been a genetic thing. It's sharing in the faith of Abraham. That's what it means to be 
a true child of Abraham. Okay, chapter three. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, there's a lot of three-day periods, aren't there? And three is the number of um, of new life, of resurrection. And obviously, Jesus was raised to new life on the third day. The third day becomes the first day of a whole new era. It's that kind of idea. It's a paradigm shift. And there's a lot of three days happening here. New life. Could it be because entering into the promised land is ultimately a picture of the new creation? Is that what is going on? Uh, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. I'd be pretty lost without Setlev, but they had the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> Uh, to follow it but with this great reverence and not going near it because remember usually this Ark of the Covenant is covered uh, when it's being carried or when it's in the tabernacle at this point because the temple hasn't been built but in the tabernacle uh, it was behind the thick curtain Verse 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all people, sorry, of all Israel, so that so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, per Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the twelve from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them, now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed, un passed by until the whole nation had, completely, had completed the crossing on dry ground. Wow. And there's a whole load of rich Bible imagery going on there. Uh, one obvious connection is Moses led the people through the Red Sea. Well, the Lord led his people through the Red Sea, but it's the hand of Moses now at the direction of Joshua. The Lord leads his people through Jordan into the land. 
But it's interesting that the water's piled up a great distance away, a town called Adam. And many hymnists and poets and Bible thinkers have made the connection between and uh, the right connection that wandering in the wilderness is like the Christian life in this passing age and then entering into the promised land is like crossing over um, well passing through death into the the, f the fullness of eternal life um, and so yeah when is when I tread the verge of Jordan bid my anxious fears subside is this idea of the the waters of Jordan is like the passage of death crossing that river and anyway more imagery connected with all this is that the waters piled up, up an Adam and it's like this second Adam has come there's a way through anyway there's a load in there I'm gonna have to call it a day sorry about all my fumbles today uh, obviously I haven't woken up en enough yet <laughs> but you're very patient with me I'll see you again soon God bless.